First they said Aryans invaded. That collapsed. Then they said Aryan migrated and that's crumbling. Genetic evidence was supposed to settle the Aryan debate. One gene, R1A1, has been used to prove Aryan migration. But new research points to something bigger, a scientific cover-up. In our earlier videos, we examined the Aryan invasion theory, decoded the mystery of Lost Saraswati River, and exposed the cracks in the linguistic and archaeological narrative. But there's one pillar still standing. One, they say, is indisputable, genetics. This episode dives deep into India's genetic code and what it really reveals about our ancestry, our language, and the origin of Sanatan Dharma. Because if DNA doesn't lie, why we are being told a half-truth? In 2017, journalist Tony Joseph wrote an article titled How Genetics is Settling the Aryan Migration Debate. He claimed that India's population was built by waves of migration from Africa, then from West Asia, and finally from Central Asia, bringing farming, cities, Sanskrit, and even Sanatan Dharma. In other words, we didn't develop civilization. We inherited it from outsiders. But is this narrative backed by conclusive genetic evidence? Or is it another attempt to explain Indian civilization through foreign origins? To find out, we need to understand how genetics trace human ancestry and why even scientists often disagree on what that data actually means. To trace human ancestry, scientists rely on two key genetic markers, Y-chromosome DNA and mtDNA. Y-DNA is passed from father to son and only exists in males. It tells us about the parental lineage. MDDNA or mitochondrial DNA comes from the mother and is passed to both sons and daughters. It reveals the maternal line. Over generations, both Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA accumulate mutations, changes that act like genetic timestamps. So, by comparing these mutations across populations, scientists can identify shared ancestries and migration patterns. For example, if two people are in different parts of the world and they share the same empty DNA markers, it likely means that they had a common maternal ancestor, no matter how far apart they live today. But here's the challenge. Timing these mutations is far from precise. A change in Y DNA might happen once every 250 to 500 years and sometimes even slower, which means dating ancient migrations using just DNA is a risky guess and not a certainty. That's why serious research combines genetics with archaeology and paleontology, which is a study of history of life on Earth based on fossils. So to cross-check DNA evidence with actual fossils, artifacts, and material cultures, so what happens when we look at all the major genetic studies on India? The results aren't what you have been told. As I dug deeper into the genetic research on India, I started noticing a strange pattern. Many of these studies then began with an open question. They began with a fixed assumption that if Sanskrit shares root with European languages, then our genes must also trace back to the same origin. But here's what most people don't realize. Language has nothing to do with genetics. A language can spread through trade, conquest, or cultural influence without any gene flow at all. You don't inherit language the way you inherit DNA. Yet, study after study use linguistic similarities as their starting point, forcing genetics to fit a narrative where India was always the receiver never the origin. I found this especially clear in a 1999 study by an Estonian biologist. He analyzed 550 mitochondrial DNA samples across India and identified a genetic marker, haplogroup U, that showed deep connection with Europe. At first glance, this looked like a proof of migration. 
But when I checked the timeline, the theory collapsed. The genetic overlap wasn't 3,000 years ago. It was 40,000 years ago. This wasn't evidence of Aryans entering India. It was a much older story of early humans who left Africa, settled in India, and from here, some migrated further into Europe. Another study by a US biological anthropologist confirmed the same pattern. Even if some Central Asian migration occurred around 3000 to 4000 years ago, it had little to no impact on India's core gene. So the so-called Caucasian feature in some of the North Indians, like sharp nose, fair skin, are not due to European ancestry. They are pre-European, formed through ancient genetic mixing around 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. And that's when it hit me. The real question isn't whether people moved into India. People have always migrated. The question is, did they bring civilization with them? Or were they drawn here because India already had a civilization? And if the Aryan migration theory is true, there should be a clear genetic footprint, a disruptive marker from around 1500 BC. So I turned to the gene most often called the Aryan signature, R1A1. As I continued digging, I wanted to know, is there any genetic disruption in India that aligns with the proposed Aryan migration? That's when things got even more crazier. The first serious genetic studies began in the 1970s. But in 1984, the Anthropological Survey of India made a key observation. They found no break in genetic continuity from Harappan people and modern Indians. So this directly challenged everything we have been told about population replacement. Then I came across the work of Kenneth K. Kennedy. In 1965, he also found no evidence of any large-scale demographic shift after the Indus Valley civilization declined. The people didn't vanish. They evolved culturally right where we are sitting right now. In 1997, a study by Brian and John identified two periods of genetic discontinuity in India. One between 6000 to 4500 BC and another between 800 to 200 BC. The earlier one, around 6000 to 4500 BC, is particularly significant it aligns with what genetics now recognize as a Y-chromosome bottleneck. A period when nearly 90% of male lineages in the world vanished. This wasn't caused by outsiders, but likely by internal wars, elite dominance or civilizational collapse. In my Mahabharata DNA episode, I explored whether this catastrophic loss could be linked to the kind of epic war described in our ancient text where entire dynasties were wiped out in a single generation. But the point remains, neither of these disruptions, not the one in 6000 BC, nor the one in 800 BC, supports the Aryan migration theory, which is around 1500 BC. So what does the data actually show? It shows that India's core population remained stable throughout the entire second millennium BC the very period when the Aryan migration was said to have shaped the subcontinent. There is no trace of a mass influx, no genetic reset. And yet, the theory continues, even though the scientific timeline doesn't support it. At that point, I knew I had to go deeper into one gene that kept coming up in every paper, the R1A1 haplogroup. So Sanatan Dharan doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. It was not brought here. It grew here. The Vedas sing of India's rivers, mountains and stars, not of some forgotten homeland beyond the Himalayas. If the people who composed them had come from outside, wouldn't they remember their own land? And yet they are in migration theory claims that a group from Central Asia entered India around 1500 BC, brought with them Sanskrit, the Vern system, and reshaped the population. So let's test that claim. In 2006, researchers like Sangamitra Sen Gupta and Sangamitra Sahu 
published a series of peer-reviewed studies analyzing the genetic distance between Indian population and rest of the world. They used a metric called FST value, a number between zero and one. The closer the value is to zero, the more genetically similar two populations are. So caste or weren't in the study referred to Brahmins or the so-called Aryans, like Kshatriya or Vaish. Tribal meant lower class or Dasyus. And here's what they found. Northern Varna and Southern Varna have a distance of 0.07. Similarly, Northern Varna and Northern Tribals have 0.06. Southern Varna and Southern Tribals have 0.05. These are extremely low, showing that Indian populations from the tribes to the so-called caste system across regions are genetically very close. Now compare that to the foreign population. North caste system versus Central Asia, 0.07. East Europe, 0.08. West Europe, 0.26. Mongolia, 0.26. This tells us something crucial. If Aryans had entered India from Central Asia and imposed a new social structure like the Wern system, the tribal Verna gap would have been larger. But it's not. The tribal and Wern groups within India are more genetically similar to each other than to any Central Asian or European population. In other words, India's population structure evolved here, together. And now let's address R1A1. Yes, it's found in high frequencies among North Indian Brahmins. And yes, it's found in Eastern Europe and Central Asia too. But frequency doesn't prove origin. Diversity does. And the highest subclad diversity of R1A1 is found within India. So what does that mean? It means that the greatest variety of R1A1 type is in India, not in Europe or Central Asia. And in genetics, more variety means the gene has been there for the longest time, which suggests that the gene spread from India outwards, not the other way around. In fact, Sen Gupta herself concluded that the direction of R1A gene flow cannot be confirmed and that the idea of it coming from Central Asia is not supported by any conclusive evidence. To dig deeper, I studied how geneticists model Indian ancestry using two categories. ANI, Ancient North Indians and ASI, Ancient South Indians. A 2000 study found that these two populations lived in different regions without mixing for thousands of years and only began merging between 1900 to 4200 years ago. This timeline overlaps with the decline of Indus Valley civilization, not an invasion but an internal evolution. And even this study found no trace of large-scale migration from Europe. The Indian gene pool remained largely stable. And that brings us to Rakhi Gadi. In 2015, archaeologists found a female skeleton, I6113, at the Indus Valley site of Rakhi Gadi. Since it was a woman, only her maternal DNA could be studied. The results were clear. She had no European ancestry. Her Iranian-related ancestry had split from the West more than 12,000 years ago. This means that the people of Indus Valley were not outsiders. They were part of an ancient population that had been in India for tens and thousands of years. And here's what matters. After the Indus Valley civilization declined, their descendants did not disappear. There is no sign of population replacement. Instead, the same people with the same genetic roots continue to live, evolve, and shape the next phase of Indian civilization, including the following eras of Mahajanpats. So the idea that new people came around 1500 BC and brought language, culture, and religion, well, there is no genetic proof for it. So what can we conclude? There is only one conclusion. The Vern system evolved internally. R1A1 shows signs of out of India spread. ANI and ASI are indigenous ancestries that blended gradually, not through invasion. The Indus people were not European migrants, but ancient Indians 
whose genetics are still running today in India. And there is no genetic evidence of RN migration around 1500 BC. So if there is no mass influx, if there is no break in our civilization, if the core of Indian ancestry remained intact for over 10,000 years, then what does the evidence really say? It says what the Vedas already said. This land was not colonized by knowledge. It produced it. India wasn't a receiver of civilizations. It was and still is its source. So what does the full picture tell us? We have examined the archaeological evidence. The cities of Saraswati Basin, built with astronomical precision, advanced water engineering, and cultural continuity stretching from Mehergarh to Rakhigadi. No traces of destruction, no signs of sudden replacement, no foreign layers buried beneath the Indian soil. Just evolution, just depth, just time. Then we look at the genetics, and the results are equally clear. Dasyus and Aryans in India are identical. R1A1, the so-called Aryan gene, shows highest diversity in India, not outside it. And even the ANISM model shows that Indian population mixed internally, not because of invaders, but because of cultural transformation and expansion. And the Indus Valley, built by people whose DNA traced back to over 10,000 years in this land. Not Europe, not the steppes. And finally, the linguistic argument often the last line of defense of foreign migration. Yes, Sanskrit shares root with Latin, Greek, and Avestan, but similarity doesn't prove direction. Sanskrit could be easily the mother of all these languages. And the spread of languages is like trade or religion. It doesn't require mass migration. It requires influence. The Vedas don't remember a homeland beyond the mountains. The Saraswati isn't imagined, it's excavated. The genetics don't point to a foreign arrival. They point to unbroken continuity. So here's what all three streams of evidence say now. Archaeology shows no invasion, only indigenous development. Genetics shows continuity and ancient origin within India. Linguistics shows contact, but not direction. This isn't just a rebuttal of the RN invasion theory. This is a case for something deeper. This is the case for out of India migration theory, that ancient Indian civilization was not a recipient of knowledge, but its cradle, its custodian, and perhaps even its distributor. We didn't borrow civilization. We preserved it, we refined it, and maybe we shared it. And now it's time that we remember it. If this opened your mind, share it with someone who still thinks we were taught how to think. Got questions? Doubts, counterpoints, drop them in the comments with hashtag AskHarryAnything. This is Harry signing off. Stay curious.